I, I got interested in, in, in doing this panel because for a variety of reasons, but then it seemed as soon as I got questions they've pursued uh, and how they see the Caribbean in relationship to uh, Latin America, to the US, to Africa, to Europe, uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, if you would like to ask a question of any of our panelists or of the panel in general, um, please use the Q&A function that's in the, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's on the right-hand side. Um, and you may post your questions there at any time. You don't have to wait till the end of our uh, meeting today, of our panel discussion. Um, so I'd, I'd like to begin um, with uh, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Davis, who is an associate professor of, in the history department at the University of Oklahoma, and she is also a co-editor of the Journal of Women's History. Professor Davis was trained as an historian of Europe, especially focusing on social and cultural history of work. But in recent research and teaching, she's examined the exchange of ideas, people, and goods between France and the Caribbean. In 2017, Professor Davis taught a dream course on race and the rights of man, France and Haiti in revolution, bringing nationally recognized scholars to campus to address the role that racism and slavery played in Caribbean and French revolutionary political ideologies. Professor Davis recently completed a book manuscript on challenges to colonial law across the French Atlantic Empire, which includes two chapters focused on the Caribbean. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Davis. And I'd like to begin by asking Dr. Davis, how did you get engaged in studying the Caribbean? Hi, thank you so much, Professor Kenny. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I do wanna just really emphasize that I recognize I am a historian of Europe and Europeans in the Caribbean, right? That I like, I have learned so much from the past decade of research that, and reading that I've done um, in Caribbean history and Caribbean studies. I continue to learn from my colleagues who are experts in that field, and I am very much not. <laughs> and so I want to kind of communicate that, um, that distinction. Um, so I first became really interested in the Caribbean um, thanks to undergraduate work that I did with um, a renowned professor of French literature. Well, he's renowned in my mind, mm -hmm. um, Sharif Keita, who is at Carleton College, where I went to school. It was in his class that I first read the Caribbean poet, M.A. Césaire, mm -hmm. who was one of the leaders of Negr the Negritude movement, which highlighted cultural continuities among people in the African diaspora. And um, I was really lucky I got to go to Paris with Professor Keita, who introduced us to Afro-Caribbean Paris. We met musicians, we met poets, we met producers and filmmakers, teachers and community organizers um, who came together in Paris to build really global careers um, and, uh, and you know, transform their home communities as a result. Um, so that was kind of my first, my first, it piqued my interest, let's say. Um, but then I went to graduate school and that was not where 18th century French history was <laughs> at all, <laughs> right? Um, and so I really felt like I, it was communicated to me that French empire was a 19th, 20th century thing, and it wasn't really a an early modern thing. And that of course is just a lie. It's just mm -hmm. straight up that is false. Mm -hmm. So I've spent, you know, a decade or so unpacking that and, and coming to understand why that um, agnotology, right? Why that's that kind of study of ignorance, right? Mm -hmm. The forgetting, the purposeful forgetting of early modern French empire um, was a political act of, uh, of the early 19th century and what was kind of bound up in that. Um, so, so that's kind of how I got here. Mm, that's, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm always encouraged, I think, by the idea that to be a scholar means to be a student. Uh, yes. That we're, uh, I understand what you were trying to say about not being an expert in the field, but uh, I think it's, it's actually one of the greatest things about, uh, about being a, a professor is that you get to dedicate your life to learning new things. Uh, and uh, 
it's kind of exciting where that path has taken you. Um, so what are some of the research questions you've pursued in your research? What, what, what has interested you the most? Right. Well, I think that my, um, my real question for my latest book project, which is on libertines, mm -hmm. is how did empire, how did French law shape the French empire of the 17th and 18th centuries? Mm -hmm. And then how did empire transform French law? That that was a, that was a relationship, mm -hmm. right? I'm assuming that. And i I believe that I found really powerful evidence that French law in the French kingdom transformed over those two centuries in um, communication with mm. French colonies in Quebec, in Louisiana, but especially in the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. That slavery was the central question of mm -hmm. um, French law and maintaining kind of boundaries um, of where slavery could exist and where it couldn't exist, right, mm -hmm. became really problematic for, um, for French legal theory and for um, the foundations of the French state. Oh, interesting. So could you tell us, for those of us who are not well-versed in this, where did slavery exist legally under French dominion and where not? And what kind of arguments did people use to justify it's abolition in some places and it's continuance in others. Right. So there's a great book. If you're interested in this question, fabulous book by Sue Peabody that's entitled, mm -hmm. There Are No Slaves in France. And uh -huh. she demonstrates, right, that there was a kind of medieval law that um, French legal theorists said meant you could not have slavery in France. Mm -hmm. um, but th there was slavery practiced throughout the French empire. 17th and 18th wow. centuries. Um, Sue Peabody does a great job of showing like, well, that's not the case because there are definitely enslaved people who come to France. There's, uh -huh. um, there are several really important legal cases that, that bring this, um, this question of slavery within France to a uh, head. And, um, and the king and the legal theorists um, are, I think the problem is that they don't take a solid stand. They're continually vacillating, mm. trying to have it both ways. So mm. that's, yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. And this is uh, roughly, again, could you tell us the time periods that you're talking about? Yeah. So yeah. my book really goes from about 1620 to 1815. Okay. 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 And, and what effect did that have then on on abolition uh, in uh, in the French uh, Empire. Yeah. So my my argument in the book is that um, abolition had um, abolition had a lot of support in um, among a few parliaments, right? Among a few kind of legal elites, mm -hmm. kind of thinking about it theoretically, not pragmatically and not um, it, how it affected practice, how it affected people's mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. throughout the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and that disconnect, I think, between theory and practice, um, yeah meant that French abolitionists never, never connected the dots in ways that those dots were connected, politically energized and mobilized in other European countries and, uh, and definitely within the Caribbean itself. Mm -hmm. I think um, the real push for abolition in the French case comes from the Haitian Revolution, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the um, enslaved people freeing themselves, overturning the plantation economy, that becomes the foundation for abolition. Hmm. Okay, okay. And so you've, you came to the Caribbean from studying France and from studying this relationship. Um, could you say more about how that has, how you see the relationship between the Caribbean uh, 
and, and France, between the Caribbean and Africa, the United States, I realize that's getting now outside of your specialization, but, but how do you see uh, the Caribbean in its connectedness with um, other places in the world? I think that's what I find so exciting about what I am learning about Caribbean history is that Caribbean history um, is world history in mm -hmm. a microcosm. I mean, I think that's really apparent, right? That there are powerful cultural influences from Africa, from the Americas and from Europe that make, that kind of merge in very different ways and um, make distinctive Caribbean cultures. Um, I do tend to kind of focus on those durable and contentious connections between Europe and the Caribbean. Um, so one example, I think, is the really fraught relationship between France and its continued um, departmental and territorial claims over specific Caribbean islands, right? Mm -hmm. Guadeloupe, Martinique, these are not um, Caribbean colonies. They mm -hmm. have been integrated into the state of France, theoretically. Mm -hmm. Right. But then we also mm -hmm. see that those territories receive so much less in terms of um, French national finances. Right. Mm -hmm. So as an example, um, in the fall of 2017, when Hurricane Irma and Maria struck the Caribbean, real devastation um, mm -hmm. hit the French West Indies. That damage really highlighted the underdevelopment of those territories. Residents were French citizens. They had representation in the national legislature. They paid taxes. Um, and so there was this real push on the French president to you know, commit to rebuilding, right? Commit to um, the, what, what these citizens are owed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, he eventually did kind of tour the islands, publicly committed 50 million euros but those Caribbean islands that are independent could apply to the UN for a disaster relief, mm -hmm. right? And that's a lot more financing. Mm -hmm. um, France actually like finally did publicly claim responsibility and like an obligation, right? Mm -hmm. um, in contrast to the US president's response to Hurricane Maria's damage in Puerto Rico, which was just denial, right? Mm -hmm. Just. Mm -hmm. um, Congress eventually appropriated $63 billion for Puerto Rico's recovery, but Puerto Rican officials now estimate only 18 billion actually reached the island. So it's these kind of real financial disparities um, mm -hmm. as a result of colonialist status that I think really begs for further investigation and um, means that the historian's work is politically engaged, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, as a result, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One, one parallel I see with uh, some of the things you were talking about um, in the Caribbean with respect to Latin America would be this asymmetry of historical memory. Yeah. That um, Latin Americans have historical memory of their relationship with the United States, say, um, that is almost entirely absent here in the United States. Um, right. And uh, that would seem an, another kind of parallel. Well, well thank you. Um, we can continue to in, engage in, 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 in dialogue with you, but I, I would like to move to our next panelist um, and welcome Dr. Greg Graham. Um, he is an associate professor in the Clara Luper Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, he is the author of Democratic Political Tragedy, in the Post Colony, uh, 2018 book. Um, he received his doctorate and master's in political science from Temple University and uh, master of science in BA degrees from the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Uh, his areas of specialization include African politics, Caribbean politics, Africana political thought, critical race theory, classical political theory, and modern political theory. He's currently working on a manuscript entitled Suffering as Vocation, in which he explores the politics and ethics of suffering as a feature of post-colonial life. So uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Graham with us and uh, ask uh, 
um, how you became engaged in the scholarly study of the Caribbean. Sorry. Um, so it okay. start for me. It started at the University of the West Indies, right? And forgive me. I'm. I, you can tell I'm not a. a, a, a I'm not adept at, the, at Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So it started at University of the West Indies where uh, when I was doing my first degree in history. Um. So um, the, it was very traditional in terms of the training. Um. In terms of the focus on rigor and so on. And so we 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 actually read widely even beyond the field of history. And so after my history degree, I did political science, which was also rooted in, 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 in Caribbean history. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the foundational Caribbean scholars, um, you know, I was I was introduced to them, you know, quite early in my in my in my academic development. Um, and especially those that came from, I guess, what Enrique Dussel might call the underside of modernity, people like uh -huh. Walter Rodney, CLR James, Franz Fanon, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had my encounter with them, you know, quite early. And mm -hmm. then the Latin Americanists, you know, people like Andre Gondefrank and, 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 and so on. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we, 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 we would explore those. And that is where my, my interest um, really began. And I would within that framework, I would ask certain questions. I started asking certain questions about not just the Caribbean, but the specific kind of Caribbean context, which I'm from. Mm -hmm. And so my the specific kind of Caribbean context that I'm from is actually urban Jamaica, more directly Eastern Kingston. Mm -hmm. And the nickname that they give to the place that I'm originally from is Dunkirk. And you will mm -hmm. find that across the, 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 um, the, 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 the Kingston landscape, the places are actually named after places that were at one point or the other um, prominent in the Jamaican consciousness as war zones. Mm -hmm. right? And so you have Angola, you have, you know, Dunkirk, uh -huh. um, you have uh -huh. all these names, all these names of places that, you know, people might have seen in war movies or seen in the news having to do with, you know, suffering and, 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 and warfare and that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. And then there are those, of course, that go back to the 70s that, um, that evoke the name of the names of places that were involved in liberation struggles right so there there it goes from one extreme to the next it goes from an, 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 an evocation of liberation struggles especially in certain political certain politically affiliated parts of the of the city to those that are just evocative of you know so you have for example places that are nicknamed beirut uh -huh. right uh -huh. uh, and, and so on and so forth so so um i started to read to ask questions about my surroundings based on what i was being exposed in terms of um caribbean scholarship and in particular radical um caribbean scholarship um, that raised questions about political economy and the the, 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 the the configuration of the global um capitalist marketplace and so on mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that, that 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 is in essence where my my, my interests you know actually begins in, the, right. in terms of the scholarship and and for those of us, and I assume some of the other people listening who are not as familiar with recent history of Jamaica, when you talk about that shift in naming, for example, over time and, and mm -hmm. the emergence of these names, what was going on in Jamaica that provoked the, those, if, if you see those as responses to things going on in reality, mm -hmm. what was going on at the time that, that provoked that kind of response? So in the 70s, um, six, late 60s and into the 70s, um, Jamaica was experimenting with what was called democratic socialism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it was exper experimenting with democratic socialism, and it was actually a part, a prominent part of the, the non-aligned movement because of the mm -hmm. close relationship between the prime minister over the course of the 70s, Michael Manley and Fidel Castro. They were actually, you know, close. Fidel Castro actually visited Jamaica, I think, two or three times. Mm -hmm. um, incidentally, the Jamaicans had conspiracies that it wasn't the same Fidel Castro that came the second time, that it was a different mm -hmm. Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, 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 that is what they said. They said, listen, that's not the same man. It's a different Fidel Castro. So the idea was that he had a double or something. Uh -huh. um, but he, he actually visited Jamaica and he and Manley were closely aligned. Um, and so what happened over that period was that Jamaicans, and in particular, people who were sympathetic or leaning to the left, they were aware of the liberation struggles of people across mm -hmm. the globe, especially mm -hmm. people on the African continent. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, there's a place in Jamaica called Jungle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 
when you go to jungle, it is divided into places that are labeled like Angola, Mozambique, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, 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 so they, they, they use these names, Nicaragua and so on and so forth. They use some mm -hmm. of these names mm -hmm. that, that, that were evocative of people in the, in, 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 in the midst of struggle. But that was one um, political party because Jamaica tended to be divided between, in the 70s and 80s, there was a Cold War dynamic at play. And so Michael Manley's party, the PNP, they were the party that was leaning to the left. And then you had the traditional right-leaning party, the Jamaica Labour Party. And it was headed by a fellow called Edward Siaga, who became closer to Ronald Reagan because he became Reagan's man in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it was in the zones that Manley con that, that, that were affiliated to, Man to Michael Manley and the PNP that you find these names that, were, that showed a certain degree of awareness about the, the liberation struggles of the 70s and going into the 1980s mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So over the course of the 1980s, though, into the 1990s, a certain neoliberal turn takes place. Uh, yeah. Where even the PNP um, had abandoned, um, except for just the label and the nostalgia, and I write about this in my, in my I wrote about this in my first book, right? Um, the PNP and even Manley had abandoned the whole notion of socialism. It had been in some ways bludgeoned out of them with U.S. foreign policy, mm -hmm. uh, because there was a process of destabilization over the course of the 19th, from 1978 to 1980, <laughs> right? It was this process of destabilization in which people like um, Kissinger and so on were directly, you know, there were there was interaction. There's there's record of interaction between, you know, between Manley and, and some of the some of some of the names that were prominent in American foreign policy at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so by the time you get to the 1990s, when Manley comes back into power, um, that that posture towards a radical socialist, you know, um, stance. Had already what was in decline and neoliberalism became the norm where by the time you get to 1994 um the pnp the people's national party the former leftist party um they could hardly be distinguished policy-wise from the jamaica labor party okay and so the naming of places takes on a whole different turn in 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 correspondence with that with with, 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 with that shift because you even if you follow jamaican popular music even the content and form of the music changes in accordance with this whole neoliberal turn, where they, they, it is no longer hardly anymore about message and more so about, you know, just the finer things in life, women, you know, cars, houses and so on. And that kind of that, 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 that sort of dynamic uh, comes into play. Hmm. But so 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 there, there, there is, as I say, correlation does not equal causation, but there is to right. be observed, you know, um, this, this, this sort of transformation that takes place over that period. Right. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, so, so you've given us a very good understanding, I think, of just at least some of the starting points for your uh, scholarly inquiries. Uh, could you tell us some more about what your what research questions you've pursued in, in your research? What have been the primary things you've been trying to understand the most? Um, so if I would say that just to, first of all, um, my first book, in my first book, I was really concerned with the question of consciousness, the nature, like how, you know, the development of, of, of collective political consciousness mm -hmm. um, as a part of really getting at the, the, the matter of how people deal with collectively political disappointments, right? And how we process political disappointments. Because in some ways, I was trying to process a certain political disappointment and the angst attached to it myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, I saw where tragedy has always been central to how Caribbean scholars formulate um, not just their struggle, but sometimes the outcomes of their struggle, where mm -hmm. tragedy is always front and center. So um, the previous speaker, who, who is it again? Um, Jennifer yeah. Davis, Professor Davis, uh, she mentioned the Haitian Revolution and so there is C.L.R. James's famous um, take on the Haitian Revolution, and it is actually rooted in, a, in tragedy, mm -hmm. right? Especially in the opening stages, he does set up this tragic scenario between the, the, the slave masters and the slaves, right? Mm -hmm. Which is um, consistent with Hegelian, um, Hegelian understandings and renderings of tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that. And then there's Franz Fanon, who is also rooted in tragedy, right? And so when I looked at the experience of people who were progressive in their politics, who considered themselves progressive in their politics, and what they attempted to do over the course of the 1970s, with all the limitations and problems with what they tried to do. Um, when I considered it, and I considered it against the, those who opposed them, mm 
and mm -hmm. recognize that in both instances, both groups were claiming to be right. And both mm -hmm. groups had a legitimate claim to what we might call the right. And so mm -hmm. on the one hand, you are the, the, the PNP and the people who are socialists who are raising the question of what national sovereignty ought to mean, mm -hmm. okay? What free, real freedom ought to look like. And on the other hand, you had the JLP, the people who were leading to the political right, right? And they were stressing the, import the importance of the economy, right? And the question of political economy, because people have to be, people have to find food to eat, teachers have to be paid, policemen have to be paid, hospitals have to be kept running, schools need to be kept open. So in their own way, they were having a legit, making a legitimate political claim. And so that framework for me led me, that framework led me back to the question of tragedy. Because again, just to, just to refer to Hegel again, he has this interesting theory of tragedy with all these problems. He has this very interesting theory of tragedy, which is rooted in his, um, especially classical tragedy, which is rooted in how he reads the Antigone, in which mm. both Antigone and, and, and her uncle actually have legitimate claims, right? Mm -hmm. And that is what makes it tragic, right? Because in the face of these, these, these claims that are both legitimate in and of their own right, um, human beings in the throes of that sort of conflict, they're unable to really recognize the ways in which they pull each other down, you know, into that downward spiral, into, into what we might, into what is referred to as, you know, a sort of catastrophe when we fail to heed warnings and so on. Mm -hmm. So, so I was really trying to answer that sort of question, just a question of mm -hmm. consciousness and in particular how people process that, that disappointment um, of the, the failure of those, those, those progressive projects. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I looked at Jamaica and I juxtaposed it with um, Mandela in South Africa. Mm. Right? And um, they're, because they're, they're interesting parallels to be drawn, because on the one hand, Michael Manley and Mandela, the plight is, there is this striking similarity between their plights, whereby they mm. are these larger than life um, manifestations of the popular aspirations, the popular progressive aspirations of their people. But then they can only go so far in a global, um, global space that is hostile mm. to any sort of, and suspicious of any sort of, Popular projects that are that is going to be that are going to raise questions about, for example, mm -hmm. the, that big no-no of redistribution, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in both cases, they are raising the issue of re, of wealth redistribution. At least the people are investing in them, the hope yeah. that mm -hmm. there will be some kind of redistribution. And in both cases, both of them are tragically flawed because on the one hand, the people have this deep investment and have this particular view of them, but in the reality, the political realities are fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, what was fascinating was that they carried out, the, 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 the pattern played out even after each of their, their, their administrations, because in Jamaica, after Michael Manley, you get this guy called Percival James Patterson, and he moved in a, a very strict neoliberal direction with the, with, the, with, the, with the society and the economy, mm -hmm. right? And he was PNP. And in the case of the ANC, after Mandela, you had Thabo Mbeke. And mm -hmm. in both cases, with Mbeke and, um, and, 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 and Patterson, they give you a sense of something that I see even in African politics today, whereby the leaders that emerge, they have this almost religious devotion to neoliberal edicts that, listen, if we do these things, then there will be growth, right? Mm -hmm. And then the question then becomes for the people who are going through this, what happens when there is no growth, uh -huh. right? Yeah. What is it that happens when there, when there is no growth? And you saw South Africa recently, in the absence of the growth that was promised in yeah. the aftermath of, of apartheid and all the reconstruction that took place after apartheid, you know, what happens, I guess the side Langston Hughes, what happens to, well, yeah, Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so um, so that 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 was that me grappling with that, with that, with those sorts, sorts of sorts of questions. And then um, I guess I'm still within that framework of, of asking those sort of questions, in particular, how ordinary people are going to be processing this, mm -hmm. um, processing these disappointments. And so now I'm, I'm moving to the question of suffering, uh -huh. right? I'm really, um, I'm really caught up with the question of suffering and what suffering actually means in a, in a post-colonial context. In particular, um, <clears throat> suffering as a result, I would say social suffering, right? So suffering that comes as a result of the configuration of the of the of the of the society and economy. Mm -hmm. um, that that's specifically that kind of suffering, not so much the, the, the one that is linked to although there are there are some links, but not so much one that is linked to the question of spirituality and, and the, 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 the broader mm -hmm. um, question of human existence in the world and, and that kind of stuff. But specifically the suffering that comes as a result of the configuration of social reality. Mm -hmm. um, and my my I, I refer to it as suffering as vocation. Because when I consider Jamaican culture, mm -hmm. one of the things I see is that if you check the music 
right? If you check the, the everyday discourse that people have amongst themselves, suffering is prominent to the extent that they label each other sufferers. So for example, where I'm from in, 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 some, in, in, in some of these, in some of the Jamaican ghettos, people greet each other. Well, go on sufferer as in what is going on sufferer. And mm -hmm. they, they label each other sufferer. They speak of their condition and their conditions as sufferer. And in some ways they appear to elevate just this identity of, of the self as a sufferer. And if you listen to the music, mm -hmm. reggae music, dance or music, and even before those, Skia and Rocksteady, you mm -hmm. hear this, 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 this recurring idea of the sufferer and what it means to suffer. And they, mm -hmm. they reflect upon it critically and so on. But my, my, my take on it is that, um, at least where I'm led is that I recognize that one of the things that they are doing in evoking this idea of suffering and, 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 and accepting their, well, appearing to accept the position of the sufferer is that it is never really about wallowing in their condition. The sufferer is always positioning his or herself to overcome that particular condition. Yeah, and so and so that, that is where I am with that, and I'm 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 I'm, I'm actually theorizing it at the moment. Um, I'm mm -hmm. a couple of chapters in. Yeah, and um, well, as soon as they, as soon as this COVID ends, then you know I, I probably can get into some field work and yeah, um, right. get, get some right. stuff done. Right. That's all very fascinating. Um, could I ask you also, both from your own personal experience, but also through your scholarship, how you've come to see uh, both Jamaica and other parts of the post-colonial uh, Caribbean and the Caribbean more broadly, um, and how it relates to the, the rest of the world, really, how it relates to the United States, how it relates to Latin America, how it relates to Africa, um, what is what is your understand what what kinds of things have you come to understand about that so um to begin with my understanding of the post colonial context is um much broader than the caribbean right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where um one of the foundations of my understanding of it is what again Sailor james tried to do with the black jacobins mm -hmm. um because when he writes about the black jacobins um at one point he actually suggested that one of the things that drew him to the Haitian experience with the revolution and its aftermath mm -hmm. was the fact that in the 1930s, when he first, when he released the first edition of the book in the 1930s, he was seeing on the horizon African states about to struggle for independence and what that might mean for them. And uh -huh. so in many ways, um, what happens in Haiti prefigures um, the, 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 the post-colonial manifestations that we get in Africa and elsewhere in the world. Right. And so, for example, the tragedy of struggle and the, in this case, the outcome of struggle um, was in many ways prefigured in, in, in Haiti. And mm -hmm. so when he does a second edition around the 19, I think in the 1960s, um, it was you know, far more clear the, the, the links that, 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 that he was perceiving in terms of the, the problems with political leadership, mm -hmm. um, the problems with, 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 with administering the state in a hostile global environment and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And so that conditions, you know, that, 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 that really set the stage for my understanding of what I do in terms of post-colonial studies when I focus, am I zeroing on the Caribbean or a particular African space? But beyond those post-colonial spaces as well, I think that um, what Akile um, Mbembe has pointed to recently in a, in, in a work of his, the title of which I can't remember off the top of my head, um, is that there is a certain way in which we have to recognize what he calls the becoming Black of the world. Mm. And he speaks of it as the, the becoming black of the world, where there are domains of human experience that were once um, deemed to be fitting and um, suited for people who were racialized, that are finding their ways now into, into, into spaces that you would least expect. And I, I think, for example, of um, a joke that Trevor Noah had done about the, former, the most recent former president, that he reminds him of an African dictator. Mm -hmm. Right, where it was a, it, it was supposed to be a joke, but it was actually quite serious. Where if one studies um, authoritarian patterns in Africa mm -hmm. and just the psychology of the authoritarian leader, right? If you trace people like Idi Amin, Mobutu, mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. if you look at them, mm -hmm. and then you look at the manifestations that are now normalized in this particular space, you get a sense of what 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 it, what the becoming black of the world is supposed to be implying. And so I think that when I do post-colonial studies, in many ways, I'm studying um, a condition of human beings that 
it will find it find its way it, it manifests in different parts of the world it, not mm -hmm. just in the in the geographically restricted zones that we refer to as post-colonial right. so that is what i see myself doing with post-colonial studies and so even on this this matter of suffering um there are a lot of parallels for example to be drawn a lot of insights as well to be drawn um from the african-american experience for example with the blues mm -hmm. because the blues epitomizes how people might have a positive attitude towards suffering or politics of suffering and what a politics mm -hmm. of suffering might look like, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. the whole idea of a politics of suffering means that I'm doing more than just suffer. It means that I'm actually using my suffering towards a particular end. And mm -hmm. so this theme of overcoming that is a feature <clears throat> of the blues, I think um, resonates with what, with what I recognize to be the case in, 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 in Jamaica as a, as, a, as a particular Caribbean space. Very good. Thank you so much. That's okay. very, very interesting. Um, we, we do need to keep moving. So I'm going to uh, move now to uh, Dr. Uh, Rita Karaszewski. I'm sorry, Kara Teshi, right? <laughs> Rita Kara Teshi. Um, Dr. Uh, Kara Teshi received her PhD in literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and has been teaching at the Department of English here at OU uh, since 2000. Um, her research and, and teaching focuses on 20th and 21st century African and African diaspora literary and cultural studies. She teaches courses on African American literature during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, she teaches courses on Black arts, Black power eras, on the post-colonial Anglophone Caribbean literature and culture, and post-independent Sub-Saharan African cinema. Um, Professor Karateshi uh, received a prestigious Fulbright uh, Scholar to study in Burkina Faso, where she taught at the university and conducted research on African film uh, in Burkina Faso and, and Ghana. Her most recent book is Literary Black Power in the Caribbean, Fiction, Music, and Film. She's also the author of Strangers at Home, American Ethnic Modernism Between the World Wars, and she is a co-editor of a book called The Western in the Global South. Uh, so, Dr. Kereteshi, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, could you tell us a bit uh, about how you became engaged in studies of the Caribbean? Well, mine was a long path um, from Hungary, and I studied that as a modernist. I was a European Hungarian modernist, and uh, when I studied graduate studies uh, in California, uh, no one had any interest in Hungarian modernists, so I started working in um, in um, American context of what American modernism means and how I would fit myself in there. And uh, first of all, in Hungary, literature and the arts are always political. So, mm -hmm. so that was one issue that I had to kind of reconcile coming into an American university and doing graduate studies. So I wrote a dissertation, which became my first book on ethnic modernism in the United States, since my modernism didn't fit in with American modernism. And um, so I wrote uh, chapters on immigrant writers uh, from Eastern Europe, um, a chapter on Native American writers, um, before the, the, um, the American Indian Renaissance mm -hmm. and then the Harlem Renaissance, neither of these would be included in the American modernist canon. Mm -hmm. uh, that research led me, I, had, uh, I started working on Zora Neale Hurston and she led me to the Caribbean. So mm -hmm. I blame Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. uh, her work in Haiti and in Jamaica, and also working on Claude McKay, who came from Jamaica to the United States and, and was part of the Harlem Renaissance movement. So I have two sort of origin stories. One is um, that the literature was always political for me. Revolutions were fought by poets in Hungary. And um, so literature was always politicized. And secondly, my um, graduate studies, I did all my T-ships, all my um, teaching in uh, political theory. Um, so I was studying literature and, uh, but I was uh, doing, I was teaching political theory. So I, so the politics and literature was always connected for me. Um, so that's kind of my origin story. Um, so that led me to the, to the Caribbean and uh, initially through the Harlem Renaissance era, 
And then I was very interested in the questions that the Harlem Renaissance raised and very sort of dated in the sense of the early modernist era, how those questions developed into the Black Power era. And even though I was not quite an adult during the Black Power era, but Angela Davis was a staple on Hungarian TV. And we sort of watched the Black Power movement in Hungary uh, through our TVs. And so I was very curious what was the narrative of, uh, of, of um, the Black Power movement in the United States. And, uh, and also kind of comparatively had this notion of Black Power and Black nationalism, which originates also from the Caribbean, but in a sense how it translates or doesn't translate back and forth between North America and the Caribbean. So that led me uh, to, to my current book that just came out um, recently, where I read Black Power studies through texts, literary texts, and through music and through film. And so my focus is on how artists, writers comment on and participate in, in political discourse mm -hmm. of, of race and particularly class and, and black nationalism. Well, that's, yeah, equally fascinating. As I said at the very beginning of this, one of the most interesting things for me is to find out what fascinating work my colleagues have been doing. Uh, and uh, this is another example of that. Uh, and you actually gotten fairly far into my second question, which was really about what kind of research questions you have um, pursued. Um, maybe I could ask you a bit if you could tell us a little bit about um, what you found when you looked, for example, at text and music and cinema uh, and its relation to uh, Black power studies. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what, what, what you found there? So I initially, I, I usually learned through teaching. So I designed this class on the Black arts, Black power movement, which was mm -hmm. mostly focused in the US. And, and I'm, as, as someone as an outsider, uh, someone who'd never studied race, but I studied class. Mm -hmm. um, so just to make sense of my environment and, and in a sense how the discourse, how people talk about race in the U.S. Um, then led me to the question of, of what's unique about U.S. race discourse, which seemed to me very particular and a very narrow discussion on race. And uh, so the discussion going into the Caribbean um, uh, was very much more aligned with discussions of, of race and class mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of a much more nuanced discussion about it. And so uh, I'm also was very interested in how politicians talked about race and how artists critique politicians and about talking um, politics and, and about especially um, about black power. So um, there are several texts uh, where uh, the um, Black Power um, uprisings or the Black Power Revolution in Trinidad in 1970 I particular is, is the topic mm -hmm. of literary texts. And I was curious, I was trying to find that. So um, I mostly focus on Trinidad and Jamaica. I also was interested how these discussions uh, sort of compare and contrast in the Anglophone and Francophone Caribbean and the Black nationalism, how is it perceived in the Anglophone Caribbean and how it's critiqued in the Francophone Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also my year in Burkina Faso sort of um, led me back to reggae music, which I do like and, and in a sense to look at how Jamaican reggae inspired African revolutionary movements and uprisings mm -hmm. in their own context. So, um, so my, my question was how arts participate in political discourse, how artists, Calypsonians, reggae, reggae singers, um, uh, poets, writers, filmmakers participate in contemporary discussions. So, so my, um, my book has chapters on um, cinema, on calypso music, reggae music. Um, I read closely contemporary journals like Abang or Moko in uh, Trinidad. 
um, that sort of um, when I read a bank, what I interested me about it is the, it sort of came out of the 1968 um, um, rebellion, which was a response to the banning of Walter Rodney, who was not allowed back to Kingston after participating in the Black Riders Congress in Montreal. And then so a bank came about, um, which was, I think, less than a year, but it, it had a very interesting narrative about which had Walter Rodney write for it, but um, academics write for it, but also the sufferers who had letters uh, into a bank. And, and it created sort of a document, textual document about how people participated in this, in this discussion about um, the post-colony in general, uh, the unresolved question of poverty, and which is color coded and race coded, um, and uh, and then how the musicians and how writers participated, and how in different parts of the Caribbean, different parts of the Black Power message resonated, mm -hmm. um, and also just the question in a sense that Black Power, the issue of Black Power, didn't really make sense because Jamaica was a, a black led. Um, a country in a sense, there was black power. Mm -hmm. So again, how to translate that and, and all these debates that happened on campus, but also off campus. Um, and um, so that's that. those were the questions that interested me and, and just in a sense, how rich this discussion is mm -hmm. once you take mm -hmm. all these different media and different genres into account. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, could you say something, I mean, again, in, in your answer so far, you've already answered a good deal of what I'm about to ask, but let me just ask you to maybe take it a little further about the relationship between the Caribbean and other places, uh, uh, the Caribbean and Burkina Faso, the Caribbean and the United States and the uh, political movements here, um, and uh, European movements of various kind, including those in Hungary. What, um, how, how do you see the Caribbean in its relationship to uh, other parts of the world? Um, to me, the, um, the encounter with Sylvia Winter's writings, which is very difficult to read uh, and very intense, but, but the rereading of basic concepts of, of humanism, who is a human, and then her rewriting of basic ideas that they were sort of foundational European, but then she turns all that on, on its head, mm -hmm. um, uh, was very important for me. Someone who came from a European so-called humanist um, context. Mm -hmm. And I, I came from a country where, for example, the homo Holocaust was never discussed. I think mm -hmm. so I learned about the Holocaust in the United States, or I even read Marx in the US because mm -hmm. we, Marx was too radical for a socialist country. We read the sort of digested version. Yeah. So in a way, kind of um, uh, engaging with um, these discussions from somewhere else where I'm from helped me gain um, a new perspective. Um, so arriving in Burkina Faso, the first kind of music I heard was reggae music mm -hmm. in French. Mm -hmm. So, so that notion of 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 um, and of course it was um, there were social movements going on in it was ten years ago and mm -hmm. uh, in Senegal, uh, Burkina Faso had its its own brewing revolution, which took place mm -hmm. about four years after I left. But mm -hmm. um, but all these debates took place to the sound of hip hop. And reggae mm. and mm. and the musicians were the ones who actually led these revolutions. Like Yana Mar in Senegal was led by uh, hip hop musicians. Um, in Burkina Faso, that uh, revolution that took place, I think in twenty fourteen, which which um, put an end to Blas Compaore's dictatorship, was led by hip hop artists and uh, but who also mixed the, uh, I mean, these, these genres are not sort of separate. They, people do reggae and hip hop in the same plus traditional African musical sounds, they all put together, but it was the musicians who led these mm -hmm. revolutions. And, and, um, and that, that very much made sense to me from a con who came from a country where, where it was always the, the, 
the artists who who were ahead of the politicians and and mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. hashed out all these ideas and were on, on the forefront of social change. Mm. That's so interesting. Very good. Um, well, again, in interest of time, I'm going to move on. I'm, I'm hoping that we can all maybe exchange some ideas uh, afterwards instead of it just being me asking the questions. But I would like to uh, move on to our last speaker, who is Professor uh, Lewis Elliott. Um, and if you just hold on a second here. Um, so Professor Elliott uh, is uh, new here uh, on our campus, and we'd like to welcome you as part of the our, our community here. Uh, he is an historian of slavery and abolition in the Caribbean and Atlantic world. He received his doctorate from the University of South Carolina, his master's from Queens University, Belfast, and uh, his bachelor's from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He's currently working on a book that explores the way that enslaved rebellions in the Americas informed British imperial attitudes toward abolitionism in the 19th century. Um, so, uh, Dr. Elliott, if you could please tell us a bit about how you became engaged in studying the Caribbean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can hear me, I hope? Yeah. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a fascinating panel already, and I, I'm so pleased to be able to add to it. Um, I, so I, I became interested in, in the Caribbean uh, from a very young age. Uh, I grew up in, in Brixton. Uh, which is in southwest London, where there is an enormous uh, West Indian population. Yeah. Um, and between that and my my family ties to South Africa, my mother uh, came over to Britain from, from Cape Town in 1975. Um, I became very interested in how uh, non-white people engaged and interacted uh, with the British Empire. Um, and I, I just I became very interested in, in how racism and white supremacy um, in institutions and structures of power um, played a formative role in sustaining the imperial power abroad. Um, and then, you know, to me, uh, growing up mixed race and rubbing shoulders with, with other peoples whose lives were informed primarily by those unpleasant truths of imperialism, um, it made it quite uncomfortable uh, to be surrounded by sort of white idolatry in, in London um, and I, I thought I saw the Caribbean as a, um, I suppose, the most visceral uh, example of that um, that power and that white idolatry being made real. Could you, could you explain that more? What what is it about the the Caribbean that leads you to say what you just said? Yeah, so yeah. I mean that sort of previews the your third question a little bit. Okay, but I, okay. I think the. Um, from a historical perspective, uh, and certainly from a British imperial perspective, the the Caribbean is the nursery of empire. It, it's where mm -hmm. it's where the British learned how to do imperialism, um, and, and for that reason, uh, everything that goes, everything that happened in the Caribbean uh, informs the behaviour of imperialists um, mm -hmm. elsewhere. And I think that that London, as this as, as a multicultural centre, um, as an international city is so heavily colored by those early lessons from the early modern period, mm -hmm. um, which I think are most viscerally seen in, in the Caribbean and narratives yeah. from the Caribbean. Okay, very good. So could you, could you tell us more about <clears throat> how this then relates to the study of, uh, of slavery, of slavery rebellion and abolition? Yeah, so I, um, I stumbled upon enslaved rebellion as a, as a vehicle Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I wanted to better understand, I suppose, my own experience, uh, at, you know, in amongst the white supremacy of, of London, um, mm -hmm. and how how I and other products of the empire, as it were, um, mm -hmm. related to it. Um, and I saw, you know, moments of moments of conflict, moments of uprising, a, a useful. Um, in the sense that they they bring to the forefront um, everyday relationships and everyday interactions. Um, so I, I, I it became it, enslaved rebellions became an easy way of answering the question of, of how 
the, the current in, racial institutions uh, exist. Mm -hmm. um, looking at these communal ideologies of resistance um, demonstrated to me uh, how just how ill-informed uh, white society was uh, when it came to the thoughts of and, and the emotions of enslaved people, um, which I think really, in, if you track through to the abolitionist ideologies of the state, mm -hmm. um, really demonstrates the continued white supremacy of state institutions after slavery is abolished. Um, there, there's something very much lost in translation between the enslaved rebels of Barbados or Jamaica or Demerara um, and their abolitionist allies in the metropole um, that allows for continued subjugation after emancipation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that you can then draw a direct line from, from that, that form of emancipation, that form of supposed racial reckoning um, to, mm -hmm. to current in current racism uh, and the ways that people don't have the language to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Could you say something perhaps as someone who has <clears throat> uh, traversed the different environments in which you've been thinking about this, right? Living and mm. studying in, in, in London, in Belfast, now in Oklahoma, um, and also maybe touching on some of the comments that were made before about say the differences between Francophone and Anglophone perspectives on some of these issues in the Caribbean itself. Um, how do you see those things uh, from your perspective? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll tackle the, the second one first. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, the differences are stark and I think the differences are yet, I think the differences are in, in many ways manufactured. Uh -huh. um, so my, my research has taken me to, to Latin American rebellion as well. Um, because mm -hmm. I, it wasn't my initial plan, but I, I wanted to see it was just morbid curiosity, really, given how, given how often the Haitian Revolution is mentioned by enslaved testimony after rebellions in the British Caribbean. I had to see if, if there were, were commonalities um, there. And, and my mentor, uh, Matthew Childs, who's a, a Cubanist, mm -hmm. he was very um, mm -hmm. encouraging about looking across empires to, to study enslaved communities to, to demonstrate that I, I wouldn't quite call it pan-Africanist uh, but a certain um, emotional community uh, as mm -hmm. it were of, mm -hmm. of suffering that uh, transcended imperial distinctions mm -hmm. and so I, I think that there were I see incredible similarities in the the attitudes and the ideologies of enslaved people across the Caribbean and, and frankly across Latin America too that are filtered out of discussion about them uh, when it comes to white observers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, the British have a almost a blind spot when it comes to considering Cuban slavery as anything other than a Spanish thing, uh -huh. where in reality, people who are enslaved in Cuba have much in common with people enslaved in Jamaica, have much in common with people enslaved in Brazil. Um, but it's the inability to recognize those commonalities that led to these, I, I, I think, that led to the divergent histories that, that we are forced to analyze today. Mm -hmm. I think there's a huge amount of, of cross-pollination mm -hmm. uh, in the Americas that is suppressed by the, the need to put things in, in, the, in the boxes of French Caribbean versus British Caribbean versus yeah spanish caribbean yeah. versus latin america versus u.s mm -hmm. south even um and there are scholars that have, have have tried to push that aside i'm thinking of someone like matthew Gertel, who does a great job of, of connecting the dots mm -hmm. uh, but it's still a pretty young field of scholarship and, and mm -hmm. i think it takes a, a brave scholar to uh, tackle that in any meaningful way yeah 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 no that makes a lot of sense well and 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 to just link this up with something the reason this panel is taking place today is because we had a group of Latin American scholars and Latin Americanists. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, uh, people began suggesting within the Latin Americanist group that, you know, we shouldn't, we, we should be connecting with the people studying the Caribbean and, and, and learn more and incorporate more. And, and so if you will, those divisions that you're talking about, right, are, we we're actually exemplify that to some degree. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess that's fairly common. But as you say, it can be limiting in a way that really we, we ought not to pursue. We, we should try to uh, 
uh, overcome that if we can. Um, well, I, I've been asking the question so far. Um, I thought I might give an opportunity uh, for each of you to um, maybe engage in some conversation with each other. Uh, I'm sure that you've been listening to things that you found interesting. And uh, Jennifer, you, you had a hand up, so maybe you, you could start. So I actually, just as um, Lewis was finishing, it occurred to me um, that your framing, Lewis, of the the perceived and communicated commonality of experience across enslaved peoples, right, across these empires um, is like so documented, so well documented in the 18th and 19th centuries, right? It results in things like a uh, school, right, that the African-American kind of claiming of Toussaint Louverture. So you have like an African-American school in Oklahoma named after Toussaint Louverture, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think my, like my favorite book on this, um, this broad cultural expression is Julius Scott. I mean, the, his dissertation kind of circulated for years and years and, um, his book was finally published maybe two years ago, uh, yeah, Common yeah, Wind, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's such a great reminder that depending on the perspective you're taking, right? You can either emphasize, oh, the difference between the French and the British, or you can see the, the articulated and documented um, conversation about the similarities. Um, and I, so I just wanted to say, like, mm -hmm. I really, I take that point really. It's a great reminder. Yeah, and I think it's. I, I'm 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 wary of pursuing this further because I, I desperately don't want to get into a discussion of how white people consider black people. Mm -hmm. um, but so much of those documents, I mean, uh, Julia Scott did a, a far better job than I did about sort of passing them out, but they were so ignored by the the powers of the day. And, and mm. so much of it was willfully lost in that translation. Um, uh, so that, that, you know, that the common wind was a subaltern thing and very real and people were aware about it, but decisions weren't being made based on those considerations. So, yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. It was a, a willful suppression um, as much as it, much more than it was a misunderstanding. I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who else would like to either make a comment or ask a question of one of your panelists? So just a comment um, to follow up on, on, on what, what Louis um, just, just, just said. Um, I, I, as a student of um, Caribbean history, um, I mark you at the undergraduate level, that's when I, you know, I did history. Um, I, I, I do recall that the Caribbean historians, like you know, the regional historians, they did recognize those links, right? Mm -hmm. That transcended the, 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 the colonial, you know, the, 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 the different colonial boundaries. Um, they did recognize, you know, those links. So for example, um, just to, you know, draw aside CLR James once more, um, he recognized, for example, the importance of the fact that one of the leading um, figures of the early part of the Haitian Revolution, um, Dutty Bookman or Bookman Dutty, um, mm -hmm. depending on you know who we decide to go to in terms of how they, they render his name, um, you know he came from Jamaica, went to Haiti, right, mm -hmm. and you know in no time he was you know leading that inaugural ceremony that actually you know got, got the revolution started, yeah, um, and. So the point I'm making is that you know Caribbean historians do you know, recognize that, and as 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 Lewis you know observes, it is when that discourse, historical discourse and research, um, is you know taken up elsewhere, right? Because I remember as a as a young historian being struck by the fact that the prominent names were you know people in the United States and Canada and Britain, you know, and that they were the ones who I learned after all that they were the ones who set the the whole state the whole character the, or the discussion of what obtains as a as, as, as good historical research and what doesn't and so on mm -hmm. but the caribbean scholars do recognize i think um that that that, that those similarities especially 
And they, they do get into this, especially when they begin to talk about the question of African cultural retentions and the consistencies you see across, across borders and so on. Um, but I had a, I had a, a question for, for, for Jennifer and I was a bit late, so you might have, um, you might have, you might have um, hinted at it. Um, the, on the matter of the, the abolitionist attitudes and the, the, the development of the, the character of the abolitionism between the British and the French, how much of it had to do with the question of hegemon? Um, so for example, um, at a time when the French were, at the time of the Haitian Revolution, the French were, accord, if we're going to read Wallerstein, right? Emmanuel Wallerstein and his modern world system, the French were either at the top of the, 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 the global economy or near there, right? Mm -hmm. And so how much does hegemonic cloud the development of abolitionism? And then the British, their, their abolitionism, um, I, well, I, I can't think of the period now, but how much does, the, does, does that 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 position at the head of the global economy as it was emerging then according to to, um, to Wallerstein. Um, how much does that impact the, the growth of their abolitionism? How much does that, does that hinder, I should say? Yeah. Mm, I think yeah. that is the debate, right? The big um the big kind of legal towns where this is um where abolition is a position embraced by a kind of minority of lawyers and judges. Right, it's it is local politics pitting them against the merchant next mm -hmm. door. Does that make sense? There's yeah, yeah. Um, they stand to gain in their own town politics mm -hmm. by kind of advancing this position against those guys. Okay, okay. The global politics is local politics okay. in um, these French kind of port towns. Um, the question of British hegemony, right? French hegemony versus British hegemony is exactly what those kind of merchants are arguing, mm -hmm. right? Saying like, this is the only chance, this is the way the system's built, right? Um, and we have to do this in order to keep up with okay. the British and the Spanish. Um, okay. that's, um, that's moot when the Haitian Revolution makes clear the only way Right, and so it's very clear, right, that abolition for the French by 1791 is the only way to have any kind of empire, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like abolition out of the goodness or like humanity, right? It's abolition with this economic objective of holding an empire together. Okay. Um, so I, yeah, I don't like your original question, though, I'm afraid I lost the, um, the string. Okay. Okay. And I, I, no, I, I, I was just wondering how far, you know, um, the, if, if people are in the midst of, you know, this prominence in terms of the, what is emerging then as a global economy, it becomes less the case. I'm just wondering, I'm speculating that it might become less the case that they will have room for, they will make room then for abolitionist ideas to um, to, 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 to take root. But I, I might be wrong. I'm just, I, I was just wondering because I know that that, that that period was a very critical period according to Wallerstein with the transition from the, the short period of French hegemony to the emergence of what later becomes um, British global, global hegemony. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I'm, I'm still really, like I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. If I may, uh... yeah. Dr. Graham, I, I, I cannot speak for the French anything, mm -hmm. um, but um, in, in terms of the, the British, the, you know, there's, it's a well-known debate, Eric Williams mm -hmm. brought yeah. this up in, in the 40s and, and everyone has been screaming about it ever since. Ever since, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that there's the, you know, the debate is whether it was, is abolition an economic position or is it a, a moral position? Mm -hmm. um, is very much rendered moot when enslaved rebellions are factored in because they didn't, you know, the, the enslaved people were not interested in the economic impact of their condition mm -hmm. or really what, you know, white Protestants believed was the moral mm -hmm. point, part, part of their position. And they very much had their own view of liberty. Uh, and certainly in terms of, for the British Empire, emancipation meant independence. Mm -hmm. from British rule uh, and so they, they 
who were very much divorcing themselves from any any kind of British view of, of freedom, and they had their own idea about it, um, which is why I think it's so difficult to to pin as, as you as you make the point. It's so difficult to pin the moment of when abolitionism became mainstream mm -hmm. uh, is because it was be the, the issue was forced as um, Dr. Davis says, but also there is a third viewpoint that was not considered at the time. I think that's right. I think it's unimaginable until it happens. And then, and it's the enslaved rebellions that make everybody make it. imagine it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excuse me for my ignorance on this, but did the slave rebellions only begin happening at a certain point or, or are they coterminous with slavery? That is, did, did rebellions happen from the earliest enslaved experiences? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. from the ships. Yeah, yeah from the ships. Yeah. <laughs> from yeah. the ships on the yeah. African coast. Yeah. yeah. But it's only, I mean, maybe Stono, but Haiti's the, the main one where mm -hmm. yeah. the contemporary observers see ideological similarities between them. Yeah. yeah. Um, they were often always explained away by local conditions uh, that mm -hmm. are not true of elsewhere in empires. Um, but but right. come, come Haiti, it, it becomes a, especially because the enslaved people say it's because of Haiti that we're doing this. Um, uh -huh. they, they can't, you know, the, the white masters cannot ignore the fact that it's a commonality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Taki's Rebellion and the, um, the rebellion, oh, I'm forgetting it. It's um, Guiana, right? Dutch Guiana in mm -hmm. the 1760s. That's like a real yeah. shakedown moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, but those, those people are not articulating their demands in terms of um, emancipation and a coordinated anti-colonial mm -hmm. effort in, in the same way that, that becomes the case in Haiti. Yeah, have you read Marjolaine Carr's book on that? Yes, it's incredible. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, could I ask a question that um, is is something again uh, I ask from ignorance, but 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 it's something that's concerned me for some time, if you will, without ever having been able to study it enough to have my own opinion about it, and that is when we think then with the central. I'm thinking of the centrality of the Haitian experience. And what um, Dr. Graham was saying about um, the tragedy of, of, of some liberation movements, uh, about what Dr. Elliott was saying about the continuation of white supremacy beyond, um, beyond abolition, uh, et cetera. And the historical record of what I do know about Haitian governance after 1804 to more or less the present. Um, how do you understand what Haiti became after independence and what it has become today in light of the things that you've been studying? Um, I would see it, and, and this is why I think um, the studying of the Haitian Revolution and its aftermath is so um, important for considerations of uh, the post-colonial state as an experience for people um, you know, in, 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 in these, in these post-colonial spaces. I think it's a combination of some of the same things you see beset the African continent, some, some uh, certain African states, mm -hmm. right? Um, where there is, first of all, the factor of the hostility of the global environment, right? And it does not necessarily have to be in the case for it because in the case of Haiti, there was this direct hostility that came from them being a society that had just, you know, done away with, 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 with a system that was put imposed on them by Europe, right? So it was a slap in the face of the notions of white supremacy because, um, you know, all the army, the Spanish army tried to capture Haiti, the British tried, and the French tried again, you know, Napoleon even sent his brother-in-law Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. to try to recapture, and so it was a slap in the face on notions of white supremacy based on the construction of whiteness that was taking place, construction of the race that were that was actively taking place in um in in, in Europe at, at, at the time, um and so they have a certain degree of hostility that one against that one has to you know what one one has to consider, 
But I think that for nation states that emerge um, in the independence period uh, on the African continent and in the Caribbean over the course of the 50s and the 60s and into the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. um, that hostility has to be seen from the point of view of how they are situated in the global economy, mm -hmm. right? And then ultimately, if you recall with Haiti, one of the things that they had to do, even during the revolution, one of the things that Toussaint Louverture um, found himself doing, I don't want to say he had to do it because that is also a matter for a lot of debate, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that he found himself doing was that he found himself um, setting up back plantations. He found himself essentially mm -hmm. reviving the plantation system because at that time it was the most advanced system of production. And as a part of the plantation system, he found himself having to, well, I, keep, I don't want to excuse him again, because again, that is a matter that, you know, people study Haiti debate as well. Um, mm -hmm. But he also had to force people back onto the plantations to work because their first instinct was to leave these plantations, these places that they, that they recollected horror and, and all that. So they left the plantations and his soldiers had to force them back onto the plantations to work, but this time for a wage, right? I guess that is how he might justify it. Mm -hmm. um, but the hostility of the global environment that I'm referring to also has to do with how nations are situated in the global economy, especially developing countries with, with, mm -hmm. with certain kinds of economies that are based on the production of raw material. One has to see that arrangement as hostile, right? Um, and I guess the degree of hostility nowadays can be seen if we consider that in the, in the Delta region and at Nigeria where they produce um, oil, mm -hmm. the, 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 the life expectancy is low, you know, um, mm -hmm. there are all, there's all this, there are all these problems attached to having this sort of, of, of wealth in terms of raw material um, that makes it a hostile environment for these states. Um, and so I think Haiti faced that. Um, there's also the question of leadership as well and the, the understanding of leadership. And this brings me to, um, to think about France Fanon. And one of the things that Fanon was trying to do in the region of the earth when he raised this question of um, the, the whole question of the impact that the Manichaean Mani arrangement of the colonial situation has upon the colonized as well as the, as the colonizer, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a way of thinking about life in the context of, of colonization where life, the, the reality is a black and white reality, a very simplistic mm -hmm. black and white reality, where if one reads the region of the earth in the first chapter, where Fanon is trying to give an account of the consciousness of the people undertaking revolution at that specific moment in which they are engaged in fighting. Because mm -hmm. the book itself is about tracing the development of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. Collected the collective consciousness of the people, the, the, the revolutionary consciousness. And so the first chapter, although a lot of people take the first chapter as the, the sum total of the book, the first chapter just presents you with one moment of consciousness. So when they are engaged in this act of revolting, how are they seeing the world? To, put, to cut it short, they're seeing the world in a very simplistic way where all we need to do is to remove the colonizer. And the colonizers happen to be European. So all we need to do is to replace the white colonizers with some black folk and things will be done, right? right. By the time right. you get to the third and fourth chapter, he's presenting people who have political experience that has taught them that, listen, it is not simply about replacing one species of men with another species of men, that your oppressor can look like you, right? right. And I think that in Haiti, um, the question of leadership, even starting with the sound overture, the, ne the necessity of leadership was such that in the in the midst of a struggle against um, against slavery and and French colonialism, it had to be military leadership, and it set the stage for a certain pattern of leadership, a certain understanding about how people lead, right, mm -hmm. and how people administer the state and so on. Because the sound overture for um, his period was uh, or his period of leadership was for was clearly a military dictatorship. And subsequently, mm -hmm. Haiti was beset by a series of military dictatorship up, up until you right. get to the Boyer regime. But right. even during the Boyer regime, there were tendencies to move beyond the constitution and cement power on the part of those who became political leaders. Right? And so I think that there are, there are external and internal factors that really set the stage for, 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 um, for, for, for what occurred in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And those external and internal factors, you can see them elsewhere as well. Because you think about how, for example, in a lot of Africans, African and Caribbean states, how the state is administered, how not just the people in power see um, administrating the state, how they come to understand administrating the state, mm -hmm. um, you know, drawing from the, from the colonial experience and continuing that sort of political culture. There's also the matter of how the people themselves come to perceive leadership and those who are supposed to govern them those who are supposed to lead them and how that makes them accommodative of, cert of a certain pattern of leadership. And then that pattern of leadership also feeds into the question of political economy in a negative fashion in some places, because to go back to Nigeria, 
the people who are most invested in generators, the people who make a lot of money from generators, some of those people are actually political figures. Mm -hmm. Right, and I mentioned generators because in some places in Nigeria, every day there's a power cut, and they rely on generators. Mm -hmm. Because, and despite the fact that they produce, um, they produce crude oil, and that is a deep violence of the of the of, of, of the configuration of the global economy that I mentioned previously. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think there there are both external and internal factors that actually contribute to getting them to where they are today. And of course, one of the external factors that one cannot deny is. Um, U.S. foreign policy and the attitude towards Haiti that I think, you know, that other thing that it clearly um, takes up the whole mantle of the French and their offense of the fact that Haiti emerged as this republic um, while slapping white supremacy in the face. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's really sad to see, sorry, quickly, just, just quickly, I think it's really sad to see because when we look at the history of Haiti, post-revolutionary Haiti, and the contribution that they made to freedom across Latin America. It is really sad to see, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the things that have befallen them since. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. um, Simon, what's his name? Simon Bol Bol Bolivar? Bolivar. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, right. Um, th there is that relationship between him and mm -hmm. Haiti and the role yes. that they played in terms of helping to equip those armies that liberated Latin American mm -hmm. countries from Spanish rule. It is really, I mean, political memory and historical memory can be unforgiving. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Would um, any of the others here like to speak to the question? Yeah, if I may. Um, so I I agree with everything Dr. Graham said, um, but I think there's Haiti held a unique place um, for the British uh, in, in this in the early 19th century as well as simultaneously the embodiment of the threat of black Catholicism, mm. but also the a, a venue in which British Protestantism, not quite Anglicanism, but certainly Methodism and Baptism, mm. uh, might be able to spread among enslaved and as, as it became mm. newly emancipated populations. Um, there were deep discussions between uh, the likes of Thomas Clarkson and, and Henri Christophe um, during the the uh, eighteen uh, teens and twenties, about removing Catholicism from from Haiti, mm. um, which uh, Christophe listened and ignored. Um, mm. But there, there was a belief that that, that um, Catholicism could be painted as the religion of the empires, mm. um, and that Protestantism, mm -hmm. Protestantism uh, was the more progressive and therefore the more uh, Afro friendly uh, version of Christianity. Mm. Um, and it, those failed, but in in that twenty year period, there were, Haiti was very much viewed as a, a, a land of religious opportunity for other kinds of hegemony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to add that the, the notion of reparations, then Haiti paid France reparations. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think all the way mm -hmm. up to like nineteen forty seven, which which kind of added to that economic impoverishment mm -hmm. and then that othering of Haiti as the first black republic. Um, so, so in a way that kind of like the, what was that Pat Robertson who sort of, yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole sort of uh, Haiti is this other mm -hmm. empire and, and this kind of not they, that doesn't, you cannot understand it in, in terms of regular political theory it's a whole different notion of humanism, the whole mm -hmm. notion of what we understand as reparations, but in mm -hmm. a sense, mm -hmm. which is kind of, which I think went all the way up to 1947. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, very good. Um, does anyone have a, a last comment to make before we begin to draw this to a close? I guess that's always, no one can dare jump in at that point, right? When you say, <laughs> you're not going to stand between <laughs> the ending of something. And <laughs> um, but let me first begin by thanking each of you. Uh, this, to me, has been most interesting. And uh, has, uh, as each of you spoke, my mind was just going in all sorts of directions. And they were all very different directions, but they all somehow seemed to weave together at the same time, which I found kind of interesting, the way that... Uh, it was disparate, but not at all disparate. It was it was really quite connected, um, and so so thank you for your work. Thank you for um, for coming to speak with us today.
Um, I also would like to thank some of the people involved with making these events possible, especially uh, Stephanie Holman Sager, who is our uh, assistant who, who really sets everything up and, and reminds everybody about what's happening and, and makes this possible in important ways. Uh, Mark McAndrew, who puts together our flyers, Jessica Dobson, who helps with communication, and uh, to the College of International Studies and the Department of International Area Studies, um, who are the source of this uh, program and this, um, this, um, the, the, the Center for the Americas and, and make it possible. Uh, so uh, thanks to each of you. Um, to others interested in the Center for the Americas, this is our last event of the semester. We try not to get into November very far because things get very intense at the end of the semester. Uh, so we'll begin again in late January um, and we'll be sending out communication about some of those events. One of the events coming up in the spring I will uh, mention and to this audience as well, uh, Glenda Eaton, who was not able to be with us today, uh, will be uh, making a presentation on her research in Belize um, it, but we haven't set the date yet, but, but sometime in this spring. Um, so that may also be of interest. So thank you again uh, for participating and, um, and uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.